Want to learn from Chicago's number one culinary arts school? Kendall College now offers a certificate training program and individual cooking classes. Go to taste.kendall.edu for more information. Voss, artesian water from Norway. Splendidly still or luxuriously sparkling. Voss, artesian water from Norway. Disaster Planning and Response Art Rescue is a first responder for the world of art, providing planning, packing, evacuation, conservation, and storage for all your treasured possessions. So we took the dinner party to radio, took it out for a spin on radio, and it was so much fun. I sure hope that we get to do that again. So uh, we had a great winter break. I hope you did as well, but we're back, and we're so excited to be here. Uh, for those of you, it might be your first time, my name is Elizabeth Alfano, and you are at Fear No Art Presents The Dinner Party. So what I do on The Dinner Party is I invite three celebs and a known chef who cooks for them. And over food and wine and chocolate and some performances, the conversations flow. And that sounds pretty good. But what's even better than that is that you are having everything that we're having. So tonight, and I can hear you guys already nibbling, tonight, You've got food from one of the best restaurants in Chicago, Everest, and our chef, Joho, is here with us tonight. Fantastic. You've got chocolate from Vosges, and I see you're all doing a little damage on the wine already from City Winery. So that's great. But there's more. You're also a part of the conversation. And if you send us some good tweets on Twitter, you're going to win some fantastic prizes. So my social media director over here, Allie, she's going to take all your tweets. So send us questions on Twitter. You can send us questions at Fear No Art CHGO. Fear No Art CHGO. And if your question is picked for us on stage, you're going to win dinner for two at Everest. We've got CDs, movie screenings, uh, music tickets, lots of things going on. So it is worth your while. It pays to tweet. So you want to be active on your phone, but you are not alone. You've got a little bit of competition. We are streaming live tonight on the Chicago Sun-Times, Chicago Splash, we maybe have it here, chicagosplash.com dinner party. So if your friends could not get tickets tonight because we are sold out, oh yes we are, we are sold out. If they couldn't get tickets, they can watch us streaming li live on chicagosplash.com dinner party and they can also tweet in to win dinner for two at Everest, which is pretty awesome. So I'm gonna give you guys some time to get up on Twitter and I'm gonna take this moment to thank my sponsors because I love them. So we have a brand new sponsor tonight, Kendall College, the very best cooking school in the land. They are here. I'm so thrilled. If you stick around, because we're going to have a little bit of an after party tonight, if you stick around, they're going to be here talking about the class schedules that they have and their certificate program. So stick around for that. We also have Vosch Artisan Water from Norway. Wonderful. You're sipping their water right now at their tables. Uh, DPR Art Rescue, the best art shippers, art handlers, art conservators, and furniture conservators in Chicago and the world. They're known around the world. I love them. We also have our, our media sponsors, and without whom I, I couldn't get the word out like I do. So Windy City Times is so supportive, and the strong, smart, powerful, wonderful, warm, kind Tracy Bame is in the house, and she's also going to be sticking around for the after party, and she's selling her board game um, called that's so gay, which is a little play on words. It's a trivia board game about all facts and, and historical uh, things about uh, gay and lesbian 
uh, famous people. So it's a great trivia game. You can kind of play it at the end of the show and, and talk to her. She's wonderful. We um, also have our media sponsor, The Sun-Times. And I do love them because we are streaming live on The Sun-Times right now, chicagosplash.com slash dinner party. OK, enough logistics. You should be up and running on Twitter and ready to go. So let's get our show started. I want to thank our first guest, who is so busy. He has to be the busiest man in media. He is a famed film critic around the globe. But of course, he is our own Chicago treasure. Richard Roper is in the house. And I think he's coming. There he is. There he is, Richard Roper. You are sitting right there. No, I'm coming over here first. I love that. Thank Where you. Where am I? Where am I? And you're sitting right here. You're right next to me. Usually I'm at the kids' table, so this is an upgrade for me. Not tonight. Uh, OK, so our next guest, so very exciting for us. We've been growing and growing and growing, as you can probably see tonight. And so I finally decided to buy one of my guests a plane ticket to fly in town, because I love her so much. And uh, we're finally at the stage where we can do that. So our first out-of-town guest that we've flown in, she's an author. She's a poet, and she is a powerful female rapper. Dessa is with us tonight in the house. Yes, I'm thrilled to have her. You're sitting right there. Should I? Should I have a seat? So we have some pretty important people with us, but uh, I'd like to call our next person our hometown honey, really. He um, is uh, heads the... the the group Tributosaurus. He is their musical arranger and, and singer. He's also his own musician and songwriter, and he's got a new business endeavor that he wants to talk to us about tonight. Please welcome Chris Neville. Yeah. Yay. Yay! All right, come on, Chris. Everybody's going to Yummy. Okay. Ooh. And then, of course, a little energy there. And then, of course, we have our famed chef, Chef Jean Joho, who is uh, toiling in the kitchen working on us, some great stuff for us. So he'll be out in a minute. So, you know, usually on the dinner party, I invite people who don't know each other, as you guys don't. And then I try to find people from different backgrounds, and then I try to find what they have in common. So there's a lot that I want to talk to you about tonight, but I can't focus on you yet because I know that we have food coming. So let's everybody watch what we've got on the video screens to see what Chef has made for us for our appetizer. Welcome to the Everest. Chef Joho, after 29 years, I'm still here. But now what we're preparing today is a canerone risotto with some wild escargot and riesling. Let's go we start. We need to sharp the pepper shells. One trick, have a sharp knife. Here we go. That's it. We are sauteed some escargot. This escargot has to be pre-cooked around for 45 minutes before. You can see this is warm. We have the pepper shallots. A little bit garlic. Stir the whole thing really lightly. The adding the escargot. You can smell it. it. Smells so good. Here I made a little bit of garlic water, the same as we use for the, the risotto later on. And we're adding a little bit of white wine. I'm never shy, I just use the big bottle, it's easier. We're all done with this, and we put it here on the side just to rest. Okay, risotto, Hannibal. Don't be too shy. We make the shallots. Add a little bit of garlic. You sweat this really well. Sweating is as you have your shells, they come in translucent. You add the rice, they have the cup, and you stir this really well as all the rice is coated. You see the rice comes almost translucent and you want to wear it a little bit for that. Some white wine. Stir it again. And now cook the white all the way down. It's very important. It takes around two, three minutes. And now the fun part comes down after now. Now we have added here a very light chicken stock. You can use a beef stock, you can make a fish stock. I made a stock, and now I'm adding little for little. And you can see a spoon, spoon, spoon. You 
add in some stock. And you do this now for 20 minutes. But it's fun. When you do this at home, you have a party, you can stir, you can stir, you can stir, and you can stir, and you can have a glass of wine at the same time. Chef Chiri, you mind? I need a glass of wine. You mind to stir it for a little bit? Stir That's why bit. I can take a break. See how easy it is? You give somebody to help you, don't as light as to do. This is some parsley puree with the watercress, the same butter we use for the escargot. Now, what you say here, they call it risotto alle ondule. See, it's like a wave. The risotto has to move. You see, you don't want the pudding and you want the soup. It has to be risotto. Now we go here. Play this. No plate. You can wash your nice warm plate. Here is no escargot. No, you can be spread it out. You put a couple of little fresh basil in. Et voilà, risotto aux escargots. Bon appétit, madame. We can pull our chef out and have a word from our chef for a minute. See if uh, Jean Joho is here. He is. Here he is. Wonderful to have him. Okay. So. What a sweat. <sighs> So how it works on the dinner party is uh, we're going to get to talk to you for a little bit and then I know you have to work back in the kitchen on our entrees, but we're, we'll take this moment to get in a couple things. So I would like to ask you, Mr. Michelin Star Restaurant, Five Diamond Star Restaurant, and you have been at this for so long, 29 years in Chicago with Everest. I mean, most restaurants come and go after a couple years. Everest has been 29 years in the making and, of course, all these accolades. And so I wondered if you could tell us, you know, what does it take to be an ongoing Five Diamond restaurant? I have a debt with it. Well, I always say to my entire staff, when everybody work for me knows this really well, I always say, what is for me good today is not good enough for me tomorrow. Oh, yeah. When I say this every day. So you're always working forward. You always have to improve what you have. Well, the day when you stop to improve what you've done, you fail. Yeah. You climb a mountain, so you're done, you fail. This means you keep climbing, especially when you have a restaurant like the Everest, you have to. <laughs> but I think, the, I think, the, key, so, but I think the, the key for success, you want to make your customer happy. And I'm listening also to my customer. And I think over these years, I'm listening to, the, to my staff. I'm listening to the customer. And I think that's a big help. Yes, of but course. also, keep a restaurant fresh. This means you know, can change everything every time, but you want to update it. The same as you update with the food, you can update with the decor, you can update with the service, with the different plates what you're using, with the different wine list. You have a lot of little details what you can use. And maybe Everest, you can make the huge changes what you're doing different. But i give you another example. I opened, I opened the Paris Club four years ago. Right now it's closed. I'm remodeling already. Oh. Why well, I think what I was, I, got, I was a very trendy restaurant. When I think trend goes very quickly away, when I'm afraid also I will go down, this means I'm changing now, it's closed and I'm reopening in all three weeks, maybe even with a new name, but I think that's what I feel, you never keep still. On, the, on every restaurant also, to be successful, I have many different restaurants, I never have two restaurants what are the same. I don't think you can duplicate what you do in one restaurant in a second round, one is individual. I think, I think Every restaurant has my own style. And you know, can reproduce that. It's not possible. I know can make Everest food in Las Vegas. I have a restaurant in Las Vegas with the Eiffel Tower restaurant. I know can duplicate this kind of food. I have people who spend some time with me, who work with me, or train with me. They know my philosophy. But I know can do the same. The one, you have a different clientele. The restaurant looks different. The whole, the whole ambiance is different. That's the reason you want it different. When you're looking like the past, if I have a brasco joint Boston, it's different food again, I think. I never like to duplicate twice what I'm doing. And so my next question for you, for someone who's constantly, you know, you've been in it for so long and you're constantly reinventing yourself and redeveloping yourself. You know, I always say, I've been, traveled the world, I lived in Paris, I lived in Italy, I lived a little bit in Bolivia, and I always say, we almost don't realize how many fantastic restaurants we have in Chicago until you leave it and then you're like, oh gosh, our food's just really that great. So now it's been all news that, you know, Chicago finally has as many fives diamond restaurants as New York. And I wondered what you thought about that, because I think we are so close to New York. Well, I think Chicago's on the map. And when I came here 30 years ago, was not so much gastronomy in the town what is today. 
Right. But also, I think Chicago always have a bad reputation. When I heard about Chicago or the Midwest, I always heard meat on potato. And that's not true anymore. It's Maybe it was 30 years it ago, was, but today it changed. And I think today is sophistication. Number one, I always talk, I have a couple of young students who worked for me 30 years ago. I hope they're good today. And certain people have restaurants today, and they are chefs, and open their own restaurant. But again, the evolution changed. Also, what changed the most, I only use fresh American ingredients. I'm talking for fresh, like the rice is Italy, and I will talk about later on about the rice. But I only use American ingredients. And trust me, 30 years ago was not a lot around. Everybody think, you have a French restaurant, you have to use French ingredients. No, the time was you fly your fishing from France, you can imagine. Woo! Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, but, but I work with a farmer. I work some farm in Michigan. I have my fishermen. And I, th I think that's where you see today, number one, the media is wonderful, but also go to the stores today, what you can find at the store. It is, no matter what kind of country you have the food, it's not any one country where you have the fine dining, but look what you can find in your grocery stores this day compare what you have 30 years ago. Yes, right. And I think this is, I like, I, I, I'm very happy to be a part of this city as this happened. And we're talking, it's, it's still a lot to do. I think Chicago is still a city in evolution. And that's, it's just so great to have that. Yeah, it's so great to be a part of that evolution. Oh. But I think when we talk about food, we talk about everything else. Here, look at all the talents where you have on, ta on this yes. table. That's all a part of what Chicago gave. It is that creative you, energy. Yeah, you heard the youth, the Chicago Symphony Youth. This is the next generation. And they this were is fantastic. like the young chefs. This is like yes. the young chefs we yes. need when they're coming up. Yes. When I think it's just, it's just evolving so fast. When I think today, Chicago, Chicago never be New York. But it's nice as the people start to compare us with, Chicago, with New York. And I think it's wonderful to see that. Well, I want to thank you for coming out because I know you're going to duck back in the kitchen and you're working on our entrees, but you're going to join us a little bit later. And we'll have you right there, and maybe with a little wine in our system, we'll all understand him a little bit better. <laughs> what do you think? You got it. Yeah, so I know you're going to be back with thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. you what? I want to add just one thing with my ex while you talk. Why is he French have risotto on the menu? And then I, I leave after that. I lived 10 years in Italy. I own the rest in Italy. I think my Italian is better as my English. I can prove it, I'm talking right now. And that's the reason since as the restaurant Everest is open, I always have a risotto on the menu. And I was the first one in 80, uh, 29 years ago, and the New York Times made me have a page. I was shocked, I was not expecting, I just made a very simple risotto. And the New York Times at the time, the best risotto in the United States. That was easy, nobody else did one. I'm guessing that's reason maybe why they gave me that. <laughs> but I think you have to be open mind. You have to be traveling too, but I think it's what I was talking about base. I think, yeah, I travel a lot. But the food would you will have, different different areas, is always my homeland where I'm coming from, from Alsace, when you have always some Alsace touches in the food. And that's what you will find out tonight. Enjoy your evening. I'll it's see you later a, on. Yes, we'll see you in a little Thank bit. You, it's Thank a you. huge treat. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Thank Chef. You. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Chef. You, <laughs> so, uh, I have to say, drink up. I, I'm sorry, but I have to say that this is one thing that always happens when you talk to a chef. When they say goodbye, the conversation is just started. <laughs> it's always it's that true, way. It's true. It's uh, true. So, okay. Now that we've got something in our bellies, I wanted to bring you all together. So. Chris, we were saying, lead singer for Tributosaurus. He also writes his own songs, and now you've got a new business endeavor that you're going to talk to us about, which is so fun. And Dessa, so she's a, a rapper, and she's also a poet and an author. You don't know these guys. You're not even from here. So it's so fun to have you here. And Richard Roper, film critic. But you also do other commentaries. Um, you're with stars, and you're with Reels channels. You do so much. I don't know how you do it all. To me, the thing you, you all have in common is that there's really no delineation between your career and your life. You're basically living your life all the time. And I wanted to ask you how each of you got in to what you're doing now, but more importantly, when in your career, I'll call this your career, but it's your life, did you realize that being who you are, your full self, is your biggest asset? Because basically you guys are yourselves professionally. I mean, you, you found your love and passion and you've made that your professional life and there's no real delineation with your personal life. So I'll start with you. Okay, I think I just realized that just now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Shit, I gotta get a life. Oh, no man. life. I have no life. Oh my wow. god. Give me a second. No. I mean, I, I think that's true of 
anybody, uh, is, it's, it's true of anybody in the arts, I think, for sure, because you have to, you have to put so much of yourself into what you're doing for right. it to be real. Otherwise, uh, people, can, people can spot a fake, and people mm -hmm. know when yeah. it's just uh, something you do on the side. And if you really believe in it and really want to, uh, to succeed in it, you need to bring your full self to the table every time. Right. Um, that's, that's been my experience anyway, and I, I think it's it served me well most of the time. It can cause trouble once in a while too, but I, but but the truth of the matter is, if you don't do it, then you'll always be an also ran. You have to you have to bring your full self to the table every time. I, I ask this question because you say you know a lot of artists do this. They they bring their life and and their life and their career are sort of one and the same. But I think you know when you realize that your true self is the most powerful asset you have. You've, you've then empowered yourself. And I think that's true whether you're an artist or you're just working as an accountant somewhere. When you tap into your authentic self, you become sort of your strongest self. Mm -hmm. I wondered for you, when did you realize that being your full self is gonna be your biggest asset? Yeah, I honestly think like I'm still really actively negotiating. Even today, it was like I was coming here and I'm, you know, I'm staying at like a, I flew in today, which is very fancy because I didn't have to take a van. One of those airplanes with the wings. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's like a Ford van <laughs> that moves at 600 miles an hour. <laughs> and, um, and I was getting ready. I knew there'd be cameras. And I was like, well, I don't I, Even just the decision like, OK, how much concealer am I going to put on under my eye? That's real. Oh, you know I what I mean? That. And yes. like, as, as, as uncomfortable as I sometimes feel like flipping through the pages of a beauty magazine at the gym or whatever, not that there are, that those images exist, but that those images have become standard. Right. Like, well, to what extent do I want to participate in perpetuating that as the absolute standard aesthetically for women? And I caved. I put a lot of concealer on. <laughs> oh, who didn't? Come on. But I, I think I'm still figuring it out. I think at first it was like, there's no delineation. But now as I, as I get older and, and maybe just live, live in, the, in the life and in the body a little bit more, I'm like, um, I don't know. I think there's something to be said for artists who let the work stand for itself as well. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I'm not really sure where to land. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes, right. And, and, and not that easy either. So what about you? When did you realize that you know just being your full self was mm. going to be the best thing you could I think do. that's a wonderful question I talk to I go to various colleges and universities whenever I can and talk to kids who are trying to become filmmakers or critics or writers and I tell them you know what I learned early on was try to find someone who shares your passion for what you are passionate about. And the most important thing that the late Gene Sisko would say, there are two things about becoming a movie critic. A, love movies. B, find someone who will pay you for your opinion. Yay. You know, But you know, early on, I mean, it was funny because I was just actually in, uh, in Denver where the Dish Network is at. And I was doing a couple of you know, things for them. And, and the cameraman said to me, he goes, do you work weekends? And I, I, it was the same kind of moment of self-realization. And I'm like, I've pretty much worked every weekend my whole life, but I don't yes. consider it work because I love movies. Yes. I love radio. I love yes. television. I love all the things I do. So yes, it's work, but it's never felt like a job ever. So, yes, you know, right. I, I tell young people, look, you're going to work for 40 years. Why don't you do something yes. that you believe in, right. something that you care about, yes. and don't just do it for the money. Don't try to plot a career. Embrace your passion and try to find a way to make a living at it. Yes, yes, yes. I, I so agree. So I wanted to talk to sort of... Um, Taking that even a step further, I wanted to talk to Dessa a little bit about your work. So um, maybe someone, if, if you're under 25, <laughs> tweet to Fair Art Chicago CSGO, because I would really like to know why there, you know, so we just had a woman CEO named of General Motors, right, very recently. Right. Women are um, surpassing men in not only enrolling in college, but getting out of college. So you're seeing all these like really empowering steps going on. Why is all, there all this insipid music for women? I know it's a, it's a younger group, maybe 18 to 22, I'm guessing, but Taylor Swift comes out with songs about falling on the floor and not being able to get up because you're, you know what I'm talking about, that song where trouble, 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 right? Do you know what I'm talking about? She just and, broke up with the guy that got her right. coffee order wrong and she's yes. gonna write a song about it, it'll be number one Tuesday. <laughs> right, and so, you know, I, I, you are so empowering in your words, and I am such a Thanks. huge fan. And the, a definition that I read about you is that you are Moss Death meets Dorothy Parker, a very famous, powerful writer. And so it's great to see what you do. And I, I'm wondering, a woman in music, and particularly a woman in rap, do you find that there are a lot of obstacles for putting it out there? 
Yes, next question. No, yeah, I mean, at, at the same time, yeah. I love that Taylor Swift song. Mm -hmm. well, and at Table song. 3 or whatever that is, we got an amazing Chicago, Chicago born and bred artist, uh, also a female rapper named Sam One, and Fluffy, her musical collaborator. So, I think, I think for me, turning on the radio, Top 40, am I oftentimes disappointed? Yes. But I, I think I'm less disappointed by individual songs than I am by the entire palette, which is to say, I get why we gotta have club songs, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, when I'm really confused morally, I'm not like, maybe I'll, maybe I'll turn on a rap station and figure out what to do. I mean, I don't look to rap for moral instruction. I don't look to, to rap necessarily for spiritual experiences. Uh, you look to rap sometimes to be like the soundtrack to a great night, you know? Uh -huh, right. But I'm disappointed that that seems to so often be all that we're looking mm to music for, um, and it bums me out that there, that there isn't more diversity, both aesthetically and in lyrical content on Top 40, absolutely. I don't begrudge anyone their success, but I'd like to see more successful people with really different successful voices. Y yes, yeah. right, I, I fully agree. Speaking of successful individuals, how many of you are familiar with Dessa, have heard her? <laughs> all right, all right, so I believe that that is everyone here, but if there is a person or two who may not have heard her, maybe this is a good time for you to perform. What do you think about that? Ooh, it's an expertly right. done segue. Be met here on stage by guitarist Matthew Santos, and he is coming any minute now. He is coming up on stage. <laughs> there he is, yay! Yeah. <laughs> oh, give it up for Matthew. Come on, give it up for Matthew. And if you are not a fan of Jessa's, <laughs> you will be in about three minutes. Thanks, Matt, and thanks for the introduction. I'm backing up so you don't whack me with your headstock. I'm backing up so you don't whack me with your headstock. <laughs> I'm just going to plug that into the back, and it should, yeah, yep, outside. there you go. <laughs> That'll work. Producer credit for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I will take 6% off the top. <laughs> uh, this is a song from Perfunctory. Um, perfunctory promotional spoiler alert. This is a song from my most recent record called Parts of Speech, which is available at one of the little round tables in the back of the room after the show. Right here. Sold by me, out of my back pocket. And uh, this is a song called Call Off Your Ghost. Thanks for the chick who just whispered yes. I heard it too, I heard it too. I'm gonna tune too. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Acoustic DJs. Last night, old friend Big Wedding, and I knew you'd be there to look at us. So come now. Colored shirts and high heeled shoes, you cross the room, just the decent thing to do. Make sure we'd all been introduced. You brought your new friend, I brought mine, shake hands, make her to say it's true. But it takes it.
lives around here I see her almost daily All I can do to stop myself from saying something crazy I don't think badly of her I hope she makes you happy It's just a lot to ask So watch your future walking past me And I know that jealousy is a perfect waste of time But left to my devices I've spent far too long wasting my Jump in and ask a quick yes, question. Yes, please do. First of all, that, that really is it's a beautiful it's song. It's beautiful. Thanks. I'm just kind of curious as to who would you list as some of your musical influences? Because oh, the guitar wait, wait, reminded me of a little. Mm. Oh, I'm, I'm no, no, it's your okay. Thunder. No, no, it's okay. No, you go. You go. I'll it's work. a dinner I'll, party. Okay. I'm the guy that always. If Downton Abbey, I'd be like the servants <laughs> thing right now. They'd be going, Oh, Mr. Barrow, really? You're overstepping your boundaries again. Just serve the bleeping turkey. <laughs> no, but, go ahead, yes. But the guitar's on a little Tracy Chapman-esque. Oh. I wonder if she's ah. like an influence. Oh, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, I do I do like Tracy Chapman, but I, I'm afraid I can't give myself any credit for that guitar arrangement. I, I Like I said, I usually play either with like a DJ or a big band, mm. big band and and I texted Matt like five days ago, and I was like, guess what? I got dinner for you oh. with you guys one small cameo. You guys sound like you've been playing together forever. That was really beautiful. Right. You have a beautiful yes. voice, too. Yes, and He's a awesome. beautiful voice. So I have a tweet for you. Okay. This tweet is from... Zucker Tallard. Okay. Uh, where do you view yourself in the spectrum of hip hop artists, especially with the recent Chicago lady come ups? And before you answer, I will say that at Zucker Tallard, you have won a signed CD. And nice. it's so very cool because she's going to be selling these CDs, so you'll want to get them, all of you. She has this wonderful index system with all the words to her poetry. I'll call it poetry, rap songs. It's really, it's such a well thought out. Nice. conceptual piece it's really beautiful like so nice. where do you see yourself on the spectrum um it sounds like I'm, i guess i am hedging i am intentionally dodging but i feel like i've been i've gotten some great reviews where it's like you know it's like nas and then it's like jay-z and then it's dessa and that's ridiculous and then i've gotten some you know some reviews that say i don't know how this woman can consciously like call herself a rapper so i try not to sweat it like if if uh -huh. rapping doesn't make me a rapper, then I don't know what would. And I don't worry about it. You know what I mean? Don't so, listen to those critics are idiots. Anyway. Critics, man. I'm just, <laughs> you know, you know? With a few exceptions. With a few exceptions. Uh, but yeah, I guess, I guess I don't sweat it. I'd like, to, I'd like to imagine that in the Venn diagram of my interests, rap is a, a considerable part of that cartography. Right. But I'd like to also be able to operate, like, you know, tonight. Well, I don't have a DJ, and it's not really the right environment to make everybody get up. You know, right? And I and I like acoustic guitar. That's the so. after party, people. So yeah, yeah. it goes from nine to nine twenty-five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I do want to say one thing. If my Rachel is around, we also, in addition to this signed CD, whoever won it, if you're here, raise your hand. Oh, you are here because you might be on a Sometime streaming. I don't know. Uh, Rachel has a really big box of Vos chocolate for you as well. Ooh. So you have one enormous nice. box wow. of chocolate. I don't know if you can see this. It's an enormous <laughs> box of chocolate <laughs> and the signed Justice CD. So that's what you get for tweeting. You see, I will folks? give you another copy of that CD if I get three pieces of that chocolate. <laughs> oh, no, he's going home. Honey, look what I got for you. I love you so much. Right. 
<laughs> so, uh, you know, I'll turn it over to you a little bit, because I was talking about how difficult it is maybe for women to get into music and then rap in particular. Mm -hmm. And are, are we still seeing that in film? I mean, uh, women used to complain that there weren't scripts for them, mm -hmm. good scripts for them. I think in terms of filmmakers, that's changed a lot. You know, when you see somebody like Catherine Bigelow, who's got bigger... Right than most men, let's just say. Leave it at that, it's a great director. I mean, it, it used to be, oh, it's a women's film, a woman's film, you know, probably gonna be sort of an indie, writer-driven kind of yeah, thing, okay. and that, that's changed. I mean, you know, it, it's still unfortunate that we don't see as many good roles for right. actresses. It's right. like Meryl Streep, gets nominated for an Oscar in Every years year. when she doesn't make a movie. She still gets nominated. Oh, Meryl Streep for going to the grocery store. And she's amazing. I mean, she's 18 nominations, you know. And, and this year, we've seen some great you know, roles for, for Judi Dench and actresses of a certain age. But usually, the men just get to keep on acting. They get right. to keep on yes, acting. Yes. But I, you look yeah. at a career of somebody like a Harrison Ford or Michael Douglas, like you look at the women who played their wives in their early roles, they're not even in movies anymore. Right. And right. Michael Douglas, he just keeps getting younger and younger wives. Gwyneth Paltrow, oh, yeah, she'd marry Michael Douglas. Uh, you know, uh, the, the Olsen twins, oh, yeah, they'd marry Michael Douglas. <laughs> so I, I, I think that's still a problem. And I think Hollywood's still missing it there. That's one of the things they're missing is finding more roles for women who aren't just playing the girlfriend, the sidekick, the ingenue. Right, right, right. And do you see that changing or we're going to be I think it's, it's getting better. It's getting right. better, but we still have a long way to go. So I think of you, for all of you, actually. I think I of me all the time, too. <laughs> What's the question? I think I'm a little bit starstruck with all of you, but you in particular, I think of like, oh, he's a celebrity in and of himself. Do you see yourself that way? Because you're around celebrity so much. Do you see yourself No, because I live in this or? city, and we've talked about how Chicago, you know, yeah. I'm from the south suburbs here, and Chicagoans, you know, we're talking with the chef about this too. I mean, it, it, it sounds cliched, but it's like, we're such a nicer New York. Uh, so we have true. all the amenities and so all the true. great things. <laughs> yes, so, yes, yes, it's so you know, true. I mean, yes. I, no, I don't. And I, you know, uh, I just don't think of myself that way because I live in Chicago. And one of the great things I think that, that Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel did when they first started doing the show and Disney bought the show and it was going nationwide and there was so much pressure to bring the show to Los Angeles, they're like, no, we're going to keep it in Chicago because we don't want to become part of the Hollywood community. Community. The show was always about should you guys spend your ten dollars or eleven dollars on the movie, and yes, that's you yes, know yes, what keeps yes. you grounded. So people in Chicago are just as likely to come up to me and talk about the Blackhawks or the White yes, Sox yes. or what's happening in the city as they are about movies. And to sort of, um, I don't know if everyone knows this. You also do commentaries on <clears throat> other things besides movies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I started <laughs> off. I was. I did not start off as a movie critic. People ask me like, you know, I got the job on the show, and you know, I'm like, well, the Sun Times already had a movie critic. His name was Roger Ebert. You know, I was <laughs> writing a column. Yes. You know, and I, I, you know, my column was always general. Interest. Interest. Most of my right. books are not about movies. Yeah, I mean, so he's an author as well. Several books, yes. Yeah, and most of them are, you know, they're about pop culture or sports. I mean, I love movies. Uh, we were talking a little bit backstage about uh, about critics, and, and you know, I'm, I'm a critic, and I love criticism, and I love reading somebody like Pauline Kael, who is a brilliant critic, mm -hmm. and, of course, Roger mm -hmm. and Gene. But I think in some cases, critics become so ensconced in the critic world, in the critical world, and they write for each other. And I yes. think just being a film critic is a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. You have to have a life outside of there, or a music critic, or whatever the case may be. You should have more interest than that, because they, they get a little bit too much you know, insulated from what's happening in the real world. And it helps you be a better critic, no? Abs when absolutely. Just like with every art It goes form, back it to what you were saying about how our lives are our jobs, and yes. our jobs are our right. lives. It's, yes. all, it, it's all integrated. Interesting you mentioned that, because Jim DeRogatis, music critic, which is how I I discovered you is on Sound Opinions. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Jim DeRogatis <laughs> was here last show, and he was talking a little bit about that, about mm -hmm. how you can get so ensconced in just writing for other critics, almost, exactly. more than really an audience. Mm -hmm. Well, so the, the question that you were going to ask Dessa, I was going to ask you and Dessa and Chris, so you have interviewed so many people. Who would you like to interview, and who would you um, also like to play with or be with? But I'll ask you first, and we can go around. Well, I've been very lucky in my career. You know, when I first came up, the coolest thing to me was when I got a chance to meet the you know the film legends that I grew up watching, I you know I remember it, I remember meeting Paul Newman, and, and this is the thing about I'm sure you guys know this too. It's like the bigger the star, the more down to earth they are, oh, and it's so like the, it's true. like the little shits on the way out, on the way up are the ones that sometimes get too full of themselves. It's like when I met Paul Newman, he walked up to me and he said, "Hi, I'm Paul," and I was like, oh. "Really? Yeah." <laughs> but he knew that, that he was like, "Hi." 
I'm Paul. Yeah. And it's you like, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there could be some of that, but okay. I mean, I think, you know, they get to a certain point in their careers where they're not looking to, you know, kind of win over the press and he's just comfortable and he realizes that Paul Newman or when I met Tom Hanks, they realize that the few minutes you're going to have with them, you're going to talk about forever. They're going to forget about it in 20 seconds. So they're very professional about it. So I've, you know, I've been really lucky. I've had a chance to interview just about everybody. I mean, I haven't had that Miley Cyrus sit down yet. <laughs> Someday. Oh, no twerking yet with her? So, so you, there's really nobody on. Sorry. So. The night is young and the no. wine is good. Who knows where it might go? Twerking, I consider a Fear no move. twerk. It's a whole different thing. <laughs> so really, there's no one that you're hoping to interview. That's amazing. Well, I mean, I'd like to, you know, there are some Kim Jong Un, you know. Well, okay, I see, uh, I see. Because <laughs> right now he's only talked to one American in his yes, entire and life. Yes, gotta stop. And yeah. his movies <laughs> in the whole Amazing. world, as somebody used to say. <laughs> well, um, what about you guys? Anybody you'd like to play with, collaborate with? I, I mean, I've been very fortunate, uh, both with Tributosaurus and just my regular career. I've played with uh, a lot of. Uh, I mean, in my opinion, almost all the great music musicians in Chicago, in one way or another, I've I've at least been able to meet them, and. Uh, I mean, sure. There, there are hundreds. It's hard to isolate any one yes, that right. I would, that I would, that I'd like to play with them. I want to play with them all, and and I think that uh, eventually I will. Ah, that's a, that's the attitude. How about you? I think I get real creepy, man. Like I think if I hear, you know, that one of my heroes is in the building or is playing, you know, at the venue upstairs, which happens every once in a while, you know, when you're um, mm -hmm. when you're touring. I tend to like lock myself in the ladies' room because I feel like <laughs> the worst case scenario is you meet them and they're horrible. Mm. And the best case scenario is they're normal and you're crazy. Like, hi, yeah. I just, I promised I wouldn't say this, but yes. yes. Um, and that's not tight, you know? So I feel like, I feel like it's a, it's a no win. Um, I would like, if I could, if I could hang out with my heroes without them knowing I was there, that would be, that would <laughs> I be great. I know what you mean, I know what yeah. you mean. I um, would love to interview Martin Scorsese. Yeah, who, who is just as, as you'd expect, he has all that energy. I'll do one yeah. quick name drop story. I was at Sundance a few years ago, and I was told that Al Pacino wanted to have dinner with me. Al Pacino, <laughs> Al Pacino, Wants to have right? dinner with yeah, you, not just, interview, Yeah, just the two of us are like, we're gonna get together, we're gonna have dinner. So we go to this little you. restaurant that they had closed the downstairs part, I walk in, there's Al Pacino dressed all in black, and this is, again, only like three or, well, maybe six years ago now. And, you know, the whole time, and he couldn't have been nicer. And the whole time I wanted to talk to him about, you know, Michael Corleone yeah, and sure. all these great movie roles. And he had, he was married and he had younger children. He was just like, so how's the latest Pixar film? Is that good? <laughs> the cars, the cars talk, right? That's what they do. They, they go around on a track and they talk. What, what is that all about? Should I see that? And I'm like, I, you know, I only had like 45 minutes of Al Pacino, and he wanted to get recommendations <laughs> to what movies he should take his kids to. That was his reality. And I wanted to talk to him wow. about Dog Day Afternoon. You know, <laughs> the cars go around in a circle, right? <laughs> Where do they end up? <laughs> did, well, he, did he yell a lot? I just want to know, did he yell a lot at the, at the dinner? Yeah, even when he's just kind of, you know, do you want to get a salad? <laughs> Let's get a salad. <laughs> I kind of yes, I want a salad. I, I'll have two. <laughs> All right, two salads. So the only fact that I know about him, and he has been sort of in my great esteem ever since, is that he loves his so dogs so much, who, the dogs have probably passed away by now, that he would drive them around the country because he didn't want to put them on a plane. He would drive his two Doberman Pinterest around the country so that they could be with him on films and on sets and location. Sweet. So yes, he seems to be like a very nice guy. My only, um, I think, story that I have is I interviewed Alexander Payne. And he was mm. so incredibly, and he's nominated for uh, Nebraska. Yeah, Nebraska yeah. this year, director. He was so incredibly down to earth. And we were on one of those crazy red carpet things where it's just inhumane how mm. they sort of shuffle people through. And you're, sure. you're yeah. not allowed to really have a real conversation because their press person is behind them saying, get away, get right. away. Like, it's really, it's really, bad. and he just kept it all together. He's like, no, you talk to me for as long as Very you want. Cool. It was really, yeah. but isn't really, that weird that like, that's the constant praise for celebrities is like, they weren't so distracted by I their know. own fame that right. they yes. couldn't have I a, know, like, right, you keep right. saying you're so down to earth. That's like, everybody's down to earth except those people. Oh. Right, like, yes. why is that super high praise? That's like, true. Are well, they funny? Are they cool? Are they when cool? I saw how freaky his world was, his entourage, yeah. the people who were pushing him. And I mean, it, it was hard. And that's why I'm surprised he kept it together, because mm -hmm. it was hard to, to be sort of normal in that situation. And 
and he really was an mm-hmm. old guy. So, at some but point, I, when you have that many handlers, you get kind of divorced from reality. You don't you don't have any that's a great sense point. of what's really you, happening. You, you know, it happens. You know? I did a, I did a, a, an event with LeBron James a couple of years ago, and Does, could, again, down earth. I mean, <laughs> but, but you know, walking through the movie complex, you know, he had a documentary about the kids he grew up with who are still he's still friends with. But walking through the theater complex where people didn't know LeBron James was there, like just. A half a foot behind him and watching people react. Yes. I wouldn't yeah. wish that on anyone. Another, but, you know, I had, I had a friend, handle it so gracefully. I had a friend who threw a show in Minneapolis where CeeLo was the headliner. Mm-hmm. He wants to show his dad what he's doing. He's a music. He's a rap promoter, and that sounds like it's not a job, you know. So he's like, "Come to the venue. Come to First Avenue, and I'll show you what I do for a living." CeeLo Green is in the back room. This guy brings in his dad. You're going to be the dad. You're going to be CeeLo Green. Okay. He okay. says, "Okay, Wait dad." Wait a minute. I'm going to be CeeLo. Okay, I'm the dad. <laughs> All right, I'm CeeLo. <laughs> Hey, Dad. Forget you! Forget you! <laughs> CeeLo, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to introduce you to my dad. This is, uh, Dad, this is what I do for a living. I, like, bring musicians in, you know? And I, and I help them to play shows. And CeeLo Green puts out a pound. He goes like this. Hey, Dad. And then this dude's dad, doing, dad puts his finger <laughs> to it. Oh, no! Oh, no! <laughs> And only, only you two know, you know that that's visually funny. Only yeah. you know how disgusting <laughs> yeah, that feels. Yeah, it's horrible. It's like, oh my god. I gotta tell you, it's not so great on my end either. <laughs> uh, uh, I think I was supposed to do the sound effect there. No, no. <laughs> that's classic. That is pretty uh. damn funny. Um, we are going to give you a tweet. And this person, Suzanne Scores, ooh, nice score for you. What are we giving her exactly? Because we keep changing it and it keeps getting better. I'm putting together a, a prize package, a uh, couple signed uh, copies of some books of mine, uh, some new DVD releases, and uh, I'll get this person into an advanced screening of a Hollywood film. Two pass, so I can bring somebody in. So that's what you get for tweeting, Miss Suzanne Spores. Good for you. And her tweet for you is, do you feel tempted to critique TV shows now that they've figured out, uh-oh, now that they've figured out how to capture the home audience? That's a great question. You know, this is a, a conversation that happens all the time now because uh, TV, television is a writer's medium and film is a director's medium. It's always been that way. I mean, if you don't have a great script, you're not going to have a great film. But the, the producers and creators, what they call showrunners of television shows, are the writers. And right now, we live in the golden age of television. People talk about the 50s or the 70s. Forget about it. I mean, the quality of writing in television right now, when you look at, like, I I believe that Sunday night, 2013, is the greatest night in the history of television. Mm -hmm. When you look at all the shows that are on, whether it's, you know, Breaking Bad, or Mad Men, or Game of Thrones, and it goes on and on and on, and it's great, Walking Dead, and it's cyclical, because it's different channels, so even when one series ends, Downton Abbey begins, and the writing is so amazing, and one of the great things you're seeing now, when I was growing up, if you were a film actor, you didn't do TV. All these TV shows you guys see as reruns, you know, those were film actors who couldn't get jobs anymore. We go back to, even back to Lucille Ball. She was a great film star, and then she had to do TV, and that was always the way it worked. Now it's interchangeable. Yeah. HBO has a new eight-part miniseries called True Detective, Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson, and yes, it's yeah. brilliant acting and brilliant yes, writing. Yes, 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 so, yes. It's, you know, so, the, so the answer to that is yes, I occasionally now do talk about TV series as well, because Overall, the quality of writing on a lot of these TV series is better than a lot of the movies I'm seeing. I mean, look, I'm going to see the Lego movie in a couple of weeks. <laughs> I'm going to guess that the writing isn't quite as to the level of Breaking Bad. I'm just going to guess. Pacino would love that, though. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I the Lego movie. movie. <laughs> no preconceived notions. Go in clean. Yeah. Yes, Could be better. True. Hey, you know what? I always, I always do. You, you never know. To. You know what? I thought one of the stupidest decisions ever was when Disney said, we're going to make a movie based on a theme ride, Pirates of the Caribbean, yeah. which was a shitty theme ride, even. You know, I wasn't even good at that. And, it, you know, $4 billion later, they win. <laughs> Johnny Depp, of course. I interviewed Sandra Bernhardt, and she said the same thing. She's going to start to do TV now because she just felt like that's where it is. And so not that films are not helping your career, but for her career, she really felt that it was TV. Well, to go back to your question, too, about women in film, you look at the actresses who are fronting these TV shows now, whether it's Glenn Close or Holly Hunter or Jessica Lange, at least now they have a great place to go with their amazing talent. Yes, 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 so true. So we're talking a lot with Richard Roper, but maybe we should see, just in case there is maybe one person in here who doesn't know what he does. I doubt that that's true, but let's take a little glimpse at what he does. We've got the good, the bad, and the ugly. Let's take a look. (laughs) I'm Richard Roper, and this is the good, the bad, and the ugly for the week that was. The good, it's us. We survived Chiberia. 
with typical grit and heart Chicago area citizens coped with and in some cases even thrived in brutal conditions. We sported creatively layered looks. We Instagrammed amazing pictures. We posted snapshots of our smartphones weather updates. We dug in and we wrote it out. I even saw a bicycling delivery man on the streets when it was 16 below. If the zombie apocalypse ever comes to Chicago, we'll defeat it. Well, The Bad, one of the best worst shows in the history of television is back. The Bachelor returned with Juan Pablo sifting his way through a gaggle of publicity-seeking fame sluts. I mean, lovely ladies hoping to find true love. One hopeful, Lauren Higginson, was sent home on day one and had a complete meltdown as if she'd been dumped at the altar by her boyfriend of 10 years. She just met the guy! Higginson claims the producers edited the talk she had with Juan Pablo to make her look like an idiot. I'm thinking that took about five seconds in the editing room. <laughs> The ugly? Yep, Dennis Rodman. One of the most embarrassing human beings on the planet returned to North Korea to visit his so-called best buddy, the vile Kim Jong-un. Now imagine if somebody like Joe DiMaggio had traveled to Germany to sing the praises of Hitler back in the 30s or 40s. Rodman singing happy birthday to this despicable thug is just as reprehensible. Now Rodman is apologizing to CNN and Chris Como and the family of Kenneth Bay, saying he was inebriated and stressed out when he had that meltdown on CNN. I am not ass ass what the hell you think. I'm saying to you, look at these guys here. Look at them. Still hasn't apologized for being best friends with the worst human being in the world. I'm Richard Roper. This is The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. the good, which is why we're going to rerun a short clip of my sponsors. We'll be right back. <laughs> Want to learn from Chicago's number one culinary arts school? Kendall College now offers a certificate training program and individual cooking classes. Go to taste.kendall.edu for more information. Voss, artesian water from Norway. Splendidly still or luxuriously sparkling. Voss, artesian water from Norway. Disaster Planning and Response Art Rescue is a first responder for the world of art, providing planning, packing, evacuation, conservation, and storage for all your treasured possessions. Our chef tonight is Chef Joho, who is here. He's going to join us in, in a little while. He's also signing cookbooks tonight, which is very fun. So stay with us for the after party. So I want to talk to Chris, because I think one of the tricky things about being an artist is when the artist has to shift and become the business man or woman. And that's not always an easy shift, right? Because as an artist, you're sort of able to see the forest and really sort of think of the big ideas and the concepts. And then you got to shift and sort of see the trees and work on all the mm. details. Tell everybody about your new project that you have going on, which is so cool, and then how you've made that switch, which is hard. Well, uh, I'm still making the switch, but uh, I have a, a new place uh, out in Berwyn, about 10 minutes west of here, uh, called Wire, which is a music venue. Um, Yay! Yeah. Yay, Berwyn! Yay, Wire! Yay, Berwyn! It's, uh, it's a music venue, but there's also a music school in the building, we're building studios and uh, putting in a record label in the spring. And the idea is that it's a, uh, it's a complete one-stop music creation space. And it can take you from point A to point B, whatever point A might be, or point B might be for you. And why did you create this? Because I don't, I don't know if you, I, I know people are getting their food, so I don't know if everybody heard you. I mean, that's a lot going on in one space. Mm -hmm. Music venue, school, a recording studio. Why did you decide to do so much? Well, I, I mean, I think that for me, the, the music industry has suffered a, uh, uh, a dearth of collaboration of late. A lot of people, everybody's got a little computer in their basement. They can, they can record everything by themselves. They can find loops that fill in the places where people used to play. Um, and that's good. There have been great things that come out of it, and it does uh, teach people the tools better. But I think you lose something there. And the places that 
musicians used to congregate and work together, the big studios mm -hmm. uh, and, and clubs that weren't just one in, one out kind of thing, they've kind of gone away. So I, I thought that if we put something together that was uh, community-based and was more than just a place where you can go to see a band, but also a place where maybe uh, you can go to learn something right. or your kids can go to learn something or a place where a local band might go to record their record or to distribute an existing record right. and all have okay. things on premises then when the next great idea comes and that can come from anywhere by the way that can come from a kid that can come from uh, a lawyer who plays guitar on the side when the next great idea comes you have all these musicians under one roof and you can say let's execute it right now yes. let's get it out there let's make something happen I love that's, that yeah that's I love great. that and what I love really about cool. that is a lot of the same reason of why I do this show is because we're all you know, we think we're communicating, we think we're in touch, we're tweeting, therefore we must be in touch, but really we're losing that sense of community, I think. And so I like to bring people together over food and then we can talk about things, even people who don't know each other, we can talk about things and maybe you guys are even meeting your neighbors right about now as you uh, clank your forks together. So, you know, I love that sense of community that you're bringing. And do you, do you feel that there's more creativity because you have people under one roof? I do, I, I mean, not that it's the only way things can happen, but I do sure. feel like when you have creative people under one roof, good things happen. Uh, when you have a chance to talk together, I mean, even tonight, you get a chance to talk together, you just get another idea, or even just a little inkling of something, you know, I never thought of it that way. That sometimes is enough to launch something great. Can I, well, can I ask a yeah. question yeah. to that? Like, I, um, I, I've worked at a music school in St. Paul. Sure. They had a, a hip-hop program. It was really exciting, because it was exciting to like bring that curriculum in. So yeah. it's a subject matter that isn't usually in, you know, involved in academia. One of the legitimate questions that I think was posed there that I'd be interested in your answer is like, how do you keep the spark, the spontaneity, the irrepressible like weirdness of artists in an institutionalized setting? You know what I mean? Well, people can't that... smoke a J, I'm imagining in your classrooms. You know, people no, they can't. cannot. Oh, they can't. Oh, Colorado. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not yet, but, but it's coming. I'm like sort of kidding. I'm sort Good of question. not kidding no, at all. No, no. You know what I mean? Because mo most of the music that I write, I write after like two glasses of wine, and I don't do that yeah. in classrooms. But class. part of that is having uh, an actual working live music venue there. I've got a 400-seat venue, sure. regular bands coming in, touring acts, local acts, whatever, and, it's, and that's there, and that's a part of the school environment. While they're not mm -hmm. learning in that space, they do have the opportunity to work in that space and my hope is that as we develop more connections with artists they're going to come in early and do a do a class or a seminar before the show sure. let the kids come in and see what they do be able to talk to somebody who's actually working in the business and that's i think that's where the difference lies is that um Academia can be uh, can can have a can have a look out at the world, but it's usually not a part of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that by bringing the two together, you create more uh, interest and it keeps us like I see. Okay. Well, you were commenting uh, during the break, uh, so you were saying now about how you never know where an idea is going to come from, right. or, or you're going to riff off of somebody else. And so when you said uh, fame, tell your line again. Fame sluts. Oh, doing I don't know. That was yesterday. <laughs> fame sluts doing something. Chris was like, fame, I'm going to work that into a song. Fame sluts. I gave, and for the record, yeah, I won't sue or anything. So fame seeking funny. sluts. Okay. Credit, okay. Yeah. But you know, Chris made a great point too about collaboration because you know this is this is a great gathering. It's a testimony to Chicago. It's like it a little bit of snow and cold. You guys don't care. You were here, which is awesome. Great crowd. But we are you know all together. But we're doing all this stuff all the time in. It helps so much to be in the same room, literally, with other like-minded people or people who are completely different in their opinions and to work off of them. I mean, I do a radio show. Ro Khan is my yes. co-host, who's you know a brilliant host, yes. and we you know we feed each other and we yes. and you play off each other. And this is one of you know I, I still love reviewing movies, but you know not only do I miss Roger as a, a dear dear friend, but I miss the back and forth. You know, to 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 give a review to a camera and get feedback from you guys is great, but to do a show where, you know, that's what the magic of that show was that Roger and Jean created, I didn't create, but to hear what the other person says, you know, and, and that I think is so important for artists, you know, and to be in the room with other creative people. I think it just probably elevates your game, right? It does. I mean, to be honest, like, I'm part of the generation, like, I'm, I'm the kid with the laptop, you know, I record all my lyrics in my closet still sure. because I got used to that. Wow. Yeah. And I can do it in my gym shorts. And if it takes me 85 tries to get the line right, because I, you know, I'm not, I'm not probably going to win any award, awards for being a vocalist. But I'm cheap as hell when I work for me, you know. And I, and I take direction really well. Um, yes. 
But I, but I, I work a lot to try, like, is this right? No, should I try it again? And eventually I get shy if I, if I do that in front of an engineer who's on the clock 80 times. Right. On the other hand, maybe I'd find that if I was forced into that environment, I'd develop a new set of skills. But everything you just said made sense. Yeah. Like, well, it's, it's not either like or. In a, you're I mean, right. It's, yeah. it's not either right. this or that. I mean, all those skills you develop there are incredibly valuable and can bring you to a position where you have an idea that's pretty fully formed. But I've always found that it's good to have an outside opinion. It's an echo chamber when it's just you. you, yeah. know? you whatever I do, you think you've got going on. Maybe it's great, maybe it's not, but right. without somebody else to look at it, it's very hard to judge. Absolutely. You know. I finally have a tweet for you. At Bonnie finally. Jor. Not finally, but because I was, I, I don't get great reception in here. I don't know if you guys have that problem. So um, sometimes my phone gets sort of stalled. At Bonnie Jor. Any advice for someone entering the music business? This is probably for both of you, but it's for Chris, which means this for and and Essa, but you guys are winning two ticks to Wire March 13th. March 15th. When, March 15th, thank you. When Tributosaurus becomes Van Morrison, and I have seen Tributosaurus oh, become wow. Van Morrison. Very and cool. it's St. Patrick's Day weekend. Yeah, it go so to the library right. yes, there, baby. Yeah, now take a cab. Yes, I love yes. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you've won those tickets. Nice for you. I love it. So what advice would both of you guys give for people entering the music business? That's a pretty wide open question. I mean, there, there's so much to do in the music business. That's that's one of the things. But if if you want to enter music as a performer, perform. Go out and, and, do. and start doing it. Just I mean, do. it's uh, it's hard as hell, and you won't make a lot of money. But if you can if you can pursue it and actually get it going, it's very it's it's the best thing in the world. Right. I would say be excellent. Like legitimately, a lot of people are worried about getting their demo straight before they're worried about getting their chords down or they're worried about getting their writing right. The other thing I'd say is keep your overhead low unless yeah. you're the recipient of a trust fund. <laughs> Get your coffee, drip coffee. You can put all the shit in it at the little bar behind you. They have milk, they have sugar there. <laughs> and every hour that you don't have to trade earning your rent is another hour that you can yeah. dedicate to mastering your craft. I so agree point. with this because to yeah. get this show going, we were talking about it during the break how m many logistics it takes to get this show going. I trade so much and mm. because I have to because we don't have that much money going on and what I find is that it's not actually the people who have the most talent and it's not the people who have the most money and it's not the people who are the best looking. It's the people who are willing to work the hardest, so get themselves to that point of excellence. And it's the people who can make their money last the longest. Absolutely. And it's the people right. who are willing to jump in, or not to not yeah, be afraid. You, you really do have to be an entrepreneur. It's like it's a, it's all about you know. When I was having my Voss water earlier before I had my city <laughs> Thank you because they're wine my sponsor. And, oh, Thank you. and I was dining oh. on this fantastic Everest food. You have to understand <laughs> that you. there's two sides to the business. It's uh, show business. Yes, yes, yes. It can, it can get tricky for sure. Um, but speaking of tricky. Because because I would like to talk to Chef Joho about that same thing. I've got a great question for all of you and I want to pull him in. But before we do that, let's take a little look at his video of what he made for our entree. Yeah. Welcome back. After a long trip, I'm back. But this time, we do a main course. What we're doing today is a filet of wild sturgeon wrapped in ham and braised in cabbage alza style. So you would call it sauerkraut, but I'm really nervous when I call it sauerkraut. In general, when you talk about sauerkraut, it's called in bank is something really sour. Not because in the middle, it's so bad. Oh, this is really slow cooked. It's really smooth. It's like silk when you eat it. That's what we eat today. What we have to start to do, we lay out the ham in, in really small layers. And you say you cook it really fine. And the way when you see it, you take the length of your piece of fish. Okay, this is your base. Now, the next step, we lay, make a layer of cabbage. You don't want it too much, but you want to spray it really, really fine out. Are you following me? Are you okay? Good. This part is done too. Now, before you put the fish in, always remember, seasoning and I'm just adding a little bit further sell. Okay, now we have this. Okay, now we put a little bit on the top. Okay. See, not the reason I put on the plastic. Now you close it. You go one first here and out. 
tire really hard on both sides. And now you keep this around sit for around 20 minutes. Now we can see this was resting around for 15 minutes. And this is ready to bake now. Now we add, we put in this in a hot oven at 375 for around 15 minutes. And this now is really hard for the oven. And now we wait around three, four minutes before you cut it. At the same time, I will make a couple of vegetables while we serve with this. I have a couple of braised radishes, Brussels sprouts, and the crones. Look at this wonderful little crones. It's a tubercle grows in the ground, and that's why we garnish the fish with. We start to put this in first. Add some braised red cabbage, radishes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, the cabbage was the spouts. Okay. And now we're ready to go. How we cut sturgeon. What we do now, we're dressing in which vegetable just a bit. Pinot Noir Jiva, just a little bit. Et voila, les jeux sont faits. Filet of wild sturgeon wrapped in ham and braised in cabbage alza style. Bon appétit. Was a so fun to cook for you. What a great time. Now is the next step. You can visit me at my restaurant and you can make a tour of the United States. Classic Joe in Boston, Everest in Chicago, Paris Club. When you're tired about that, you can go to the studio Paris. You can meet me in Las Vegas in the Eiffel Tower restaurant. Maybe people heard about Hamburger. It's a French name for Hamburger. And maybe I'll see you there. Enjoy it. It was nice to have you all this evening. And I hope to see you soon. Bon appétit and still the beginning in January. Have a wonderful year. Happy New Year. We need a regular red chair. chair. It's coming. They'll get it. Oh, thank you, Dessa. Dessa. We'll get Dessa a chair. No, no, okay, no, well, you, no, you, <laughs> Oh, dear. I know. Oh, oh, a bravo for her song first. I think it was yes, a wonderful yes, song. Yes. I heard it in the back. Thank yes. you. That was yes, wonderful. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, uh, here we go. Join the table. So, Chef, Where's I want to ask you, and I'm going to ask everybody at the table. We'll start with Chef, but I want to hear it from everybody. So, we were talking about this creative process and how much of the success that you've all had, starting with Chef, but everybody, how much of it is work? How much of it is luck? Because that does play a role. And of course, how much of it is skill? So I'll start with you. Do you feel that you were born with a natural palate, or has this been hard work the whole way? Or luck? Well, no luck, I think, is maybe the last thing that happens. The general. last thing. I think the most important, I grew up in a bigger family, and food was always my passion. Yeah. And it's still today. I think you have to be passionate. Mm -hmm. Why everything else after that comes easy, but when you have no passion, you never know be successful. And I'm sure everybody on this table have the passion what they do. And I'm in the restaurant business. I'm passionate. I always talk. I come a certain age. I don't like to do it. I just don't do it anymore. Yeah. I have a passion. I like to do what I'm doing. And so long as I have the strength or my head is working, I will do it. And it's really passion. The rest come from alone. I think. We talk about stars or movies on, on financial. That's all accessory. You do your work right. When you make it for love, everything else comes from alone. Everything that's else what comes. I believe. Yeah. It's so that's true. What I believe. How do you guys feel about that? Any luck involved in what you do? Well, I, I think there's some. I, I think that as far as, I, I, mean, I get this like I, I get this a lot with Tribute to Swords because because we do a. Uh, a lot of work every month, and we put on a, a great show, if I do say so myself. And I do. Yes, yes, just, um, just, for the, just in case people don't know exactly what Tribute Sonoris is, tell them what it is, because I know we have fans in the audience, well, but it's a lot of work uh, every we, month. Uh, for the last uh, about 12 years, uh, every month we put on a, uh, a tribute to a different artist. We try to recreate the sounds of the recordings exactly, so 
when we did Queen, we had 24 singers. When we did uh, when we did the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper record, I had a 40-piece orchestra. Wow. Um, when we did Paul Simon, I had a, a four-piece uh, Native American flute ensemble for El Condor Pasa. You know, mm. it, it's whatever the song requires, we go and get it. We don't do it with samples or tape, and the, and that's it's a labor of love. Uh, and thankfully, it's been a success. But really, it's it's about the work, and I think. Um, you're right. Passion is what gets you there. Mm. Work is what makes you great. And and ultimately, I, one of my good friends who plays with us all the time, I won't name him, uh, I've seen him go off on people who after the show come and say, oh my God, you're so talented. He says, can I swear on the show? You can do he it. Says, oh, I have fuck seven you. times already. I am not talented. He says, I bust my ass on yeah. this shit. I put a fucking 200 hours on this month on this. Yeah. So I'm not talented. Here, here that is that. belittling yeah. my work. Yeah. And it's true. No, I, I, I mean, exactly really, you, you, uh, maybe there is an aptitude and a talent to it, but it comes down to you got to put in the time and you yeah. got to study there's and work. No way around the world. You know, and that's that's what gets you good. And then I think commercial success, there's some luck there. But but you're right. I think if but you put you know the time. You know, the thing is also evolution for your savoir-faire, what you know in your career, what you evaluate, and that's the reason you become on this step where you take success. Right. 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 But I personally think it comes from alone. It's all the knowledge would you building up. I think this makes mm -hmm. you success. I think you know start to sing right away. It's all your learning experience. I think everybody on this table is on the first movie you saw, you said to critic. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you saw that. I think it's all an evolution. You have to pay your dues and it's step. Like, oh, right. People creating recipe is not. It's an evolution for new craft what you have during the all years, what you have going on. You don't come up with something very new like this. Or, yeah, you can't, but I have no sense. Right. But I think it's evolution of what you're doing in your career. Mm -hmm. and I think well, well, so many one hit wonders or band, like uh, these guys that came out of nowhere, you find out, yeah, oh, right. they've been on the road for 15 years. <laughs> right. Yes, right, exactly. And by yeah. the way, Chris, when are we going to get the Starland vocal band show? <laughs> Come on, man. I've we been did, waiting. We did, we did do, we did, uh, do uh, Afternoon Delight on the Delight. 70s one hit wonders show. Afternoon Delight, they won, and I missed it. They oh. won Best New Artist. They won the Best New Artist Grammy of the Year. Who do they beat? Who knows? They beat Boston. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, I, I should give you a tweet prize for that. That was some pretty good. Yeah. I'd like the chocolate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I bet you would like the chocolate. <laughs> well, so th this brings me up to another question then. Since we kind of all agree it's, it's hard work that really is the bottom line. Although I will have an anecdote. I heard on a radio interview when Gene Siskel was still alive, mm. he said that he had no intention, correct me if I'm wrong, he had no intention of being a film critic. He was a journalist, mm -hmm. and they said, yeah, we need you here. And he kind of tripped into that, as did yeah, Roger Ebert. Gene Siskel was a philosophy major at right. Yale, and Roger Ebert was a, the sports editor of the Daily Illini. But at the time, the film critic jobs were kind of not considered prestigious. They actually created that whole profession. They made it. That's why they're so yeah. big. Yeah, you know. and I want to go back to something that Dustin yeah. said earlier about be yeah. excellent, because yeah. that's true. And the same thing the two gentlemen were saying. Uh, when that door opens, you have to be prepared. Right. And yes, there's a little bit of luck. But when people say to me, and I, I, I get it, they don't mean to be insulting, but people say to me, I get this every day, I get this on Twitter, I want your job, they say. And I'm like, I, 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 what job? Which job do you want? I want your job. And I know what they're saying. They go, I want to watch movies for a living. It's about 5% of what I do. Yes. And it's, it's all about the hard work. It's the, you know, the Malcolm Gladwell thing about doing 10,000 hours of something. Yes. When I started at the Sun-Times, I was 23 years old, and I got a job there basically answering the phones and getting coffee for other reporters. And I kept sending, you know, giving the editors my writing samples. And when the managing editor of the paper took me out to lunch to say, have you ever thought about being a columnist? I reached into my briefcase and I handed him 10 sample columns that I'd already written. <laughs> right there. You know, there. do yes. the work. Don't say, oh, I want this to happen to me. Sarah right. Silverman always says yeah. When yeah. people say to Sarah Silverman, I want to do this, I want to do that, she always goes, you're never going to do it. <laughs> you're, just talking about it. you're never going to do it. That's why Nike is worth 80 freaking billion dollars. Just do it. Just you do know? it. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. But you have to be ready for that moment. Building off of the, oh, my poor paperweight. Um, building <laughs> off of this idea, I wanted to ask you, because you had talked about this evolution to get to a recipe that you think is good enough. I'm curious for all of you, but I'll start with Chef, and then I have a tweet for you. Um, where do you get your inspiration to create? And for all of you, but we'll start with Chef. The most important, I think, is the ingredients. Ah, they inspire you. They inspire me. When I go on a market or go in a store or in my house, I have the ingredients when I use. This gives me the impression. Yes. You have a great vegetable, a great piece of fish. That's gives me. 
And he gave me a really old piece of veggie, but I have no inspiration to cook with the spaghetti. Yes, it's right. All, yes. It's all about what you find. Well, number one, why I always believe a chef who eat his own food never go eat in his restaurant. And I can tell you. Yeah, I don't food. like those skinny chefs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stop a lot. Wait, wait, tell me that again. I'm not sure I caught it. Say that again. I believe, as a, and it's more as this, I believe as every chef will, will feed with their customer have to be able to eat the same thing. Ah, uh, yes. When okay. you go in a restaurant, you have 60 course. I want to know which chef who sits down and eats mm -hmm. the 60 course. He will not. Right. Oh, I see then what I believe us, you, have, you, you, you have to eat your own food. Yeah. Do you, yes. Have you ever drawn inspiration synesthetically? Have you ever drawn inspiration from something that is not food? Or no. does it usually stem have from food? Okay. Have, have to be food. Have to be the good. Shut up. It would have been cool yeah. to be <laughs> It would have been so awesome. <laughs> Yeah. That would have been so awesome. He said, I one day was looking at Van Gogh's yeah, Starry Night. Know. And I thought, truffles. Yeah. By the way, the chef was awesome as uh, the first villain in the first Die Hard movie, wasn't he? By the way. He's a big movie fan. We talk about movies all the time. It's but true. It's so I great. Actually, uh, there's Alan also Rickman. a Muppet that's very much like you, right? He's the, that's he's, fantastic. To be very careful. I would have I no, stopped with Alan Rickman, but OK. Wow. OK, we're moving right along. OK. I could do things to your food you don't want to know about. <laughs> That's no, the next but, one. But I love the yeah. Muppets. They had a great movie. They, okay, you, inspiration. You. <laughs> Me. <laughs> you. <laughs> What's the question again? Uh, inspiration. Right? Where do you, actually, Des says, well, where do you guys draw yes. your inspiration from? <sighs> oh, oh chocolate. Is, I, chocolate. So do you draw I, inspiration I have, from I have food? a super Thanks, douchey Minnie. answer to that. I think, like, <laughs> I think I've always been a little bit loath of, like, the model of inspiration, which implies oh. this kind of um, Tinkerbell romantic thing, which which I, I've known artists that work like that, mm. that get on an idea and it's exciting and it feels exalting. But I, I have very few of those moments, not none, but very few. For me, it feels like you get hungry, so you eat, and you get tired, so you sleep, and you get that art feeling, and so you find a decent thing to, to spend some ink on. But mm. for me, it feels less like I'm being pulled towards a source of distant light than I am being pushed from behind. You know? I mean pushed from like a like a, a visceral need to I don't want to get like you know too paperback about it but um <laughs> oh, I love yeah. that but there's yeah. a lyric right there yeah. write oh, that yeah. down Chris I'm gonna write some okay. great tunes yeah. <laughs> he's like oh I'll do a song called paperback writer I don't think anybody's done no. that no nobody's done that but yeah it's it's a I don't know it, it it's a it's a it's a moodiness I guess to be totally frank I'm probably not a hell of a lot of fun to hang out with you know? like an itch to scratch or no it's more like worse. a drink to okay. drink yeah. okay right <laughs> Or, okay. or a rent to pay. Or sometimes. a rent to pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sometimes that. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's it feels a little blue sometimes, um. and it feels like being you know an appetite more than it feels like a distant north star. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I get it. Any any inspiration? I, mean, I, I think uh, I think inspiration is overrated. I think uh, if you know <laughs> your craft. I mean, really. I think I think if you know your craft and uh, you have a song that you want to write or a purpose for a song you want to write you draw from all your life experience and maybe it is, I mean everything's an inspiration maybe you remember uh, a relationship or a feeling or a great piece of fish or whatever it might be and that becomes your inspiration I think that the the need for the song makes you go through your catalog of these are the great things that happened to me in my life or the terrible things that happened to me in my life or the things that made me feel this way or that way in my life, and this is what I'll write about. What's the need? What, from whence did the need for the song stem? Was it was it alimony or rent or what? what why did you need? The song? It can be any of those things. It, it can be. I mean, I'm I'm kind of a deadline-driven writer. Okay. So I like to I like to have a, a purpose for. I have to have this done by here, right. and then usually an hour or two before I do it. Yeah. Okay, so that's a great segue because Chris has been so busy working on his new club, Wire. And I told him, look, it'd be great if you could perform tonight. So why don't you tell us how that came about and then give us a little bit of something, something. Okay. Um, should I go and... Go ahead and okay. explain how it came to be. So I was told I had to do a uh, song tonight and Tribute to Soros, we do all cover material, um, which is uh, not um, licensing friendly. And... <laughs> And I have, I, I've had a number of... So I'm uh, going to do a song called Goodbye Purple Road. <laughs> <laughs> but I've, I, I mean, I've had um, a lot of different uh, original projects over the years. I'm uh, working, putting together kind of a record now that I'm hoping I can do sometime before the end of the year. But um, 
I, I'm in one of those phases where I kind of hate everything I ever wrote uh, up to this point. Um, it, it happens. It, it's just, you know, you kind of are sick of everything you've done and you don't want to do it anymore. So I said, okay, I'll just write a song for the show. And then uh, this morning I woke up and I thought, oh, I should write a song for that show. Um, <laughs> and, and then right now when I was enjoying the chef's great food, I thought, oh, God, i got to write a song for the show. <laughs> So aside from the uh, inherent amount of sympathy I expect because this is a fresh song, um, I, this is uh, something I just, I just put together because I thought it'd be fun to do something for the show. Uh, this is called The Dinner Party Show. <laughs> but when I write, I always write from the perspective of um, this guy in my head who I change him into whatever I need him to be to sort of look through his eyes and figure out what he is. So this is a guy who has... Um, has this girl at work that he wants to uh, he wants to get together with, but he's always around his work friends. He wants to get her over, so he throws a dinner party to get her to the apartments. Aww. Now I may forget the song halfway through, but that's okay. I'm writing it as we speak. So <laughs> the food is done, the wine is poured. Now I listen for the door. Hope that I can put on this charade Linens on the table The candles warm soft glow Now I think I'm ready For the dinner party show Well you sure look nice Tonight the way your eyes catch the moonlight Don't think I've ever seen your hair that way Sure looks great. How about the weather? It's insane. And oh, yeah, work's been such a pain. It's great we had some time to see the whole game. But inside, I want to hold you, want to take you in my arms. And all these other people fade away. Had to throw this party just to get you here tonight I sure hope that you're feeling the same way Is that a new brand dress you have on? What is that silk? Oh no, chiffon That color sure does work for you, my dear That much is clear What about that game? Can you believe what Peyton Manning had up his sleeve? <laughs> Everybody's heading for the door I catch your eye and know right then You're wondering the same We need to clear this room for something more So don't forget your hat or your gloves Please send my family all your love We really should do this again real soon I'll check my book. See you at the office there, my friend. You have your keys, good. See you around the bend. We'll finish this again Monday afternoon. I hope to get to be there real soon. Ah, real soon. I'll take care of that drink. Have a good night. <laughs> My other friend has left the room. So here we are. Let me refill your wine The best part of the party's here The time when you're all mine Yeah, all right. Woo. Inspiration coming from the dinner party. Storyteller. Such right an there. honor. Storyteller is right. Woo. I'm going to uh, that was, that was pretty, um, do you like to say tight? Can I say that? Well, that's what you said the other day, like, that's not tight. Okay. I had a, I had a, do you know Kevin Koval, spoken word poet? I don't. No. So he was saying the other day on the show, the last time you were on a show, that's so, pimp? No, that's so, there's a new phrase that, uh, don't, 
That's pretty dope. It's I don't not, think that's me. Not, that's uh, not, uh, I, remember, I remember when Richard Nixon finally said, that's so dope. That's what it really was sweeping the nation. Almost is true. I have a tweet for Chef and this person. And by the way, I'm just going to do the quick Nelson Mandel interpretation for those of you who need some help with the chef. Uh, oh. Too soon? Oh, too soon. Oh. He was 95, okay? <laughs> too soon. Too soon. I, I don't understand what's going on. Thank you. Two people uh, over there knew what so I was saying. So, this person, dinner for two at Everest. Wow. The rest of you oh. missed out. Oh, man. Jay Robinson, what motivated you, chef, to leave France and come to Chicago to start a French restaurant 29 years ago? Well, uh, at the time, I was approached by the owner of one to reopen Maxims in 1984. And I never was in the United States. I never spoke word one of English. I thought, well, why not? I find out what the United States is. I came here. I find my wife the first day. And I stayed. Well, how did you meet your wife <laughs> the she, first day? She was the restaurant business. At the time, she was running a restaurant. I opened Maxims, so the same company had mm -hmm. the Bastille restaurant. And I came for the flight, the owner for the company. We don't sleep the first day together. We, I just meet her the first day. I have to we are not busy. asking. We are. <laughs> but I think it was the first day. I meet her the first day. She was waiting. The plane was around six hours late. I landed around 11 o'clock at the night. And I meet her the first day. But also, I saw oh. Chicago and I saw the potential of what this city had. Yes, right. And I, at the time, I bought four chefs with me to run the restaurant. I thought, you know what? I started and I left. And I never left after that. Wow. But I really like Chicago. I do. Yes. That's great. Yes. We appreciate that so much. You. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, sort of wow. building off of what you said before, that you, you've seen things change because now you can get ingredients that you couldn't get 29 years ago, and, and you've seen sort of the development on the restaurant end. How have you noticed that the public has changed over 29 years? Well, I think, number one, you have, it's a sophistication happening. Yes. I yeah. think they know more about it. Mm. But so I want more. to give you one little trick what I think is important. Just always remember, what you put in yourself, in your body, you are the only responsible for that. You no are the blame only personal who are responsible for, responsible for that. You, you can blame nobody else. Yeah. Not right. all this restaurant served me this, this restaurant. You're the first person you want it or you don't want it. I know everything was served, I will eat. Mm -hmm. Yes. I never will serve something. All my staff, we never serve thing where I personally will eat or we never will eat. And I think that's where it begins, for the beginning. Be responsible for yourself, what you eat. It's your this body. You take it in you. That's it. Has, has I, recent, way too late, I read the book, The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. Yay. Totally spun out my head. Yes. Mm. If you haven't checked it out and you have three spare hours, I recommend it. Yeah. How, how do you, as a, as a chef, incorporate local fare do you have a lot of answering to do for prices do you not worry about it has it been a, has it been a project of like consumer education like hey this is why local is important or, or not really no that's i have a, i have a very good chance i have different restaurants this means the price is never a problem in certain restaurants i don't can fly my fish overnight for the for maine directly in chicago mm. i can charge for i have some restaurants that's the reason they have a different price range mm. but i think you no i think it's everything but also, you talk about omnivore. I have certain things who I don't like personally. Yeah. I never would serve in my restaurant. Well, for you know, example, lots of people what would talk. That be? Everybody talk. You have to eat brain. I never understand why the people eat brain. Brain. When I'm, yeah, brain. Yeah. Kidneys. I personally don't like it. I never would serve it. Mm -hmm. I always believe I would only serve. Hannibal Lecter, like party of one. <laughs> <laughs> brain will be served. Yeah. How, how do you take a big risk? Then? I feel like if I take a huge risk, then I've ruined someone's three and a half minutes. Mm. You know, or they can click skip on YouTube or right. on my CD. You only have that moment to. Yeah, but and they can also opt out. And yes. if they've if they have taken a big risk with me on a song that they hate, they are out 99 cents. How do you take a big risk without worrying that you're going to forfeit your? Your but I, I still am a believer what I serve, what I personally like, and this is my style. When I think each restaurant has to have its own identity, on its own personality, what they serve. When sure. I think that's between restaurant and restaurant, it's the same in your business. You have certain singer will come up, they go, we heard this, so on and so on and so You just put two little notes inside, and that's it. But I think it's the same. You have to have your own personality on your own style at the restaurant. You know, today you go, in, you go in a restaurant today, how many more you can have sashimi? You know, once it's with this, one with this, one with this. It's still a sashimi. The Japanese were here a long time ago before yeah. the United States exist. But yeah. put your own so style, true. what you want to eat. Well, when I was growing up, sushi was how people said Susie and Berwin. So we've got <laughs> uh, much more sophisticated.
it is. still but is. I think what the chef is saying, it kind of goes back to what we're saying. It's like he's saying, you know, he's not creating dishes to get that five diamond rating or that three star rating. He's doing it because he believes in the dish. He's and passionate. I think that whether it's music or writing or food, it has to start with if you believe in it. And I think, you know, this city in particular is so good at figuring out a fraud. You know, if you're just mm -hmm. trying to do it to please other people, it's not going to work. That's true. And we also talked about how hard work is really the core to what you do. Absolutely. And this city is so behind people it's a city works. for that's hard the, you know, work. That's the slogan. Uh, Nick Bowling, who's the <laughs> assistant director at the Timeline Theater, and I just love him. He has a famous quote that I love. L.A. and New York have to focus on the hits. And focusing on a hit can detract from the work. In right. Chicago, we focus on the work, mm -hmm. and that can make for better work. So is that is that hella Chicago, then, is, like, is coming coming visiting you know for the mm -hmm. evening yeah. part of me is like I'm, I'm trying to compare the the stud turkle vibe here mm -hmm. to like the culture that I come from or, or the culture maybe that I have the opportunity to visit I mean I think some people love the idea are romanced by the idea of virtuoso to the extent that they don't want to they want to hear right. you know what I got hit Just in the head with the baseball yeah. and I wrote right, that shit on right, the piano yeah. and I can't read yeah. music yeah. So you know Circles what I mean? the, is the classic example his one of his most famous books was called Working Work. yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. so yeah. I'm trying to figure so, out like yeah. to what extent do you imagine that that's uh, that that's true of the Chicago culture but maybe maybe less so I don't I, I mean brought more broadly I actually I actually had a, an interesting conversation with uh, with a, a couple of touring musicians that, I, that, that I've worked with a few times and they all said the same thing. They said, you know, we, we get guys from all over the place, depending on it. It's, it's one of the big touring. I don't know if I can say it. So. Say, say, if you feel like it. Uh, it was the Brand. Beatles. No, it was the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> They're huge. Um, <laughs> check them out if you haven't. They're really good. Um, but, I, I mean, this is a group that tours with a, with a big stable of musicians. Transylvania. And the Transylvanian of, Orchestra. Transylvania. Close enough. Transylvania. Um, <laughs> right? Those are the guys. Trans-Siberian. Trans-Siberian. Uh, yeah. Transylvania is the, but, the vampires that do the same thing. I was talking to one of the guys from there, and he said, you know, one of the things that they, they like to work with um, Chicago musicians, but I think this, this applies kind of to uh, the Midwest, Midwest in general, yes. is, is just that uh, because they don't bring anything to the table. Mm -hmm. Like, you get New York cats, and there are great players out of New York, great players. But they all have an attitude about it. Mm -hmm. And like, well, I, I'm great. And I'm from New York. <laughs> right. And, you know, kiss the I ring. And LA, too. I mean, there's some of that. But in, in general, the reputation here is that you get a guy who's going to do the work, know the show, and bust his ass to make it right. And there's no baggage. You and know, we respect that. So that's something we oh, really absolutely. respond to. Yeah. So the, the reason I, I mention it is because, you know, to have these great restaurants that are coming up and really putting their heart and soul into it, you know, you don't know if people are going to go and try out the restaurant or try out the song. or. or I think or, Chicagoans are a lot more adventurous than they used to be. And just to go back to the no Trans-Siberian Orchestra, by the way, who do this, you know, do you guys know who they are? You know, so they, you know, they, they played the, the Allstate Arena a couple right. weeks ago, and I saw them. And they're great. And they have these amazing costumes and the flowing hair and everything, and it's like, they seem very, like, Northern European. Dun, 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 dun. And the guy who's, like, been with them forever, he finally says hello to the crowd, and he goes, I grew up in Orland Park. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then they have this, um, this, this uh, Asian-American uh, violin whiz, and this kid is, like, flying around, and he's doing these amazing things, and he's like, and my parents are here. They're from Schaumburg. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, you know, true story, it's... Right? it's there, there are, there's, there's a lot to be said for the work ethic here. Because yeah, again, absolutely. it goes back to the work. You do and the work, and everybody you gets behind that, though. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I keep saying that is because, you know, if you went to New York, where, of course, in LA, where it's going to be a lot more expensive, you know, it's hard to start. And people really yeah. get behind people who are just starting, but they're willing to do the work. Yeah. If you're willing to do the work, you're going to have the respect from people here. I have a tweet for the entire table, and I want to tell that tweet because the winner. I'm probably pronouncing this wrong. Shaish14 has won two mm. tickets. Talk about hard work. Has won two tickets to the Chicago Youth Symphony Orchestra. Ew. And they were fantastic, those kids working so hard. They're going to play May 11th, a Mother's Day concert at Chicago Symphony Orchestra. So that person has won two tickets. And their question for the entire table is, how do you get through rough patches or naysayers and stay focused on your dream if you're getting some negative feedback? Negative feedback? What? <laughs> I've, I've never had any. I, I, I'd be interested to know. No, it, 
Negative feedback is part of, part, of part of the deal. I mean, you yeah. find out pretty early if you're thin-skinned or thick-skinned, and if you're thin-skinned, you're out. What are I you? Mean, are you just, are you, are you thick-skinned absolutely? Yeah, all I mean, at be, some right? point, you got to say, you know what? I'm sorry I didn't like it, but yeah. this is what I do, and, mm -hmm. and that's it. You know, I, I admit I'm medium skinned. Like I like. The, <laughs> I love that. I like the idea of being thick skinned because yeah. I think that's badass. I think that's the best way to get through the stuff. Like, I, I don't. I wish I were, but I don't know that I am. Like there have been some some what? reviews that that I'm like a little embarrassed to acknowledge have kind of gotten under mm -hmm. the skin. But that doesn't mean it, that doesn't mean it doesn't get to you. It's just that it doesn't affect how you do it. It's do. affecting me. <laughs> how, about, how about you, Chef? What about um, reviews with you? I think one is constructive. Mm. Yeah. I accept it, mm. and I will do it better. Mm. What is not constructive, then I just forgot it, and I, I jump on the next step. Right. Yes. But I think one, and first it can happen. Everybody makes mistakes. When I have somebody who have a critic or called me and said, have a bad meal or write me a letter, in general, I have a so little in general, I call the customer myself. Right. Cool. Well, I think mistakes happening, maybe I, I don't know, but I want to learn on two mistakes you learn. And then in general, that's the best way to handle right. it. Yes. So long as it's constructive criticism, I love it. And not just abusive or, yeah. But when somebody told me, oh, they're like, you know, they're not like this, this uh, the venison, they're not like the chopped, they're, they're not like the fish, and they're going to take, you yeah, have like nothing, why we have vegetarian, we only eat raw food. Well, you know, so right, right. like, right. I, I hope Goodbye. you find a restaurant that you do like. That's okay. Like, I'm sorry. Like, yes, I, in general, I call them back. I'm, like, I'm sorry. I like to even, I like to invite you back, but it's not my kind of food. What I'm doing. I'm so? sure you have some other guests. Some would do that. Yes. Based of luck. Yeah. And then move on. Mm. Yes. What about you? Well, I, I'm in a little bit of a unique position as a right. critic because I hear from a lot of people saying, "Well, you're a critic. You don't know what it's like to be criticized." I'm like, "Well, no, because I was on this iconic television show. So, you know, the first week I was on the show, David Letterman did a monologue joke about my toupee." which is not a toupee, by the way. Uh, and, and, then a, and then about a, you know, six months later, I was a joke on The Simpsons. And then Matt, I mean, which all, I thought was all awesome. I still bummed that Saturday Night Live never made fun of me. But it was good for me to see like, the other side of that, too, yes, and, to, right. and to understand that I think constructive criticism, the, the late, great Robert Altman, one of the great directors of all time, said to Roger Ebert, if you never gave me any bad reviews, why would I respect the good yeah. ones? Right, right. yes, so, right, sure, you know, sure. It's like if, I think the, you know, the greatest critics, the best critics are the people who actually love movies or food or music and write from the standpoint of a fan. And I'm rooting for every single movie I see, no matter what. Before the, before the curtain open and the film starts, I'm rooting for it. I want to share with people, this is great. If it's not, I owe it to them tell, to tell them why it's not. I, don't, go, go. I, I was just going to add, like, so there's a, Minneapolis is known, I think, for having like sort of, um, sort of kid-gloved critics. Mm -hmm. They're very delicate with their artists. We talk about That's that. That's where Michael Phillips from the chicken from, by the way. Wait, but, uh, <laughs> well, it's a friend, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Pussy! <laughs> what? <laughs> And, um, and and as much as as much as that might you know spare the occasional like ego blow, mm -hmm. take from a ten thousand foot perspective. Yeah. Like in my opinion, I'm like you know that's probably not. I, I wouldn't like to be coddled in my in my home market, so right. that when I venture in a broader way, Absolutely. I'm not really aware of my weaknesses. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm interested in knowing when you pen a review, and you're not feeling it. Mm -hmm. To what extent, as you submit that review. Um, are you imagining how it will ring in the ears of the originators versus of the potential consumer? Uh, I'm always aware of that. And that's going back to why Gene and Roger and Roger and I kept the show here in Chicago. Because if you become friends with too many people in the business, and I am friendly with some of them, and it's really tough. Yeah. So I am aware of that. I mean, Ben Stiller famously told me backstage at The Tonight Show, um, they have a guest book that you sign where everybody says, hey, Jay, thanks for, you know, coming on the show and everything. And Ben Stiller wrote, to Ebert and Roper, take those two thumbs and shove them up your ass. Uh, because, he, because, of a, because of a review we gave. And he said after, he goes, it just matters so much to me what you guys say, which is hugely flattering. But, you know, he said, he, this is the movie was Zoolander, which, by the way, has become a huge cult hit, but was not movie. a huge hit. And he, said, and he said backstage, he goes, I spent three years of my life working on this film. And Roger said, I spent an hour and 40 minutes of my <laughs> life watching it. <laughs> Trust me, I'd like to have it back. You know? And he respected that. You know? So I do think of that. But again, it's, it's, I'm not reviewing the movie for the filmmakers. I'm yeah. reviewing it for you guys who love movies. Right. Yeah. So I always think for myself when I get negative criticism, I always think, thank you and onwards. Mm -hmm. Right. Did you say thank you and awkward or thank, thank you, you and, and Sometimes awkward. <laughs> thank you and onwards. Okay. 
because I, 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 I love what I do. So I'm sorry that that person didn't like it, but I'm still doing it. And I'm sure there's a point there that I will think about and ruminate on, but I'm still going. So yeah. Every once in a while, it's okay office. to also just say, I'm sorry, I can't hear you from my giant mountain of success. Can you say <laughs> that a little louder? That has not hey, happened to or, me. Or just think it. Just that think has not happened to me. That. But something that does happen to me is... The show goes 15 minutes past its end time, and nobody wants to leave. So I am sorry to have to do this. Oh. This is going to be the last question. But then, I hope you all stay, because we got a little bit of an after party going on. She's going to sell CDs. We're going to eat chocolate. He's going to sign cookbooks. Uh, Windy City Times is here, and so is Kendall College. And we're all, and the bar's open, and we're staying. Woo! So I hope everybody stays with us. I have one quick question for you, and thank you to our Sun-Times viewers for hanging with us yeah, tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sometimes, thank you. I have one quick question. I'm gonna go around the table, one word answers if you can. It ah. is, like Chef said, the still one the word. beginning of 2014. I'm wondering if you're still keeping your New Year's resolutions and what are they? Hit it. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, what were they? I, I didn't make any this year, I figured. Yeah, I got enough on my plate. All right, yeah, fair enough. Okay, moving on. No. Yeah, no, you no. not sticking to it or didn't do it? Uh, did it and like fell off on January 9th. What was it? Can I ask? Yeah, it was like a stupid hippie cleanse thing that I was like, this is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I <admit> it. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to see anybody. <laughs> All right, so that's done. That's <laughs> over. What about you? I stopped around 30 years ago to make it to the Yeah, it's so good. So smart. So smart of you. And you, sir? I'm going to break mine in about 14 seconds, actually. <laughs> oh. Go ahead. Come on, chef. Let's just tell everyone. Okay. <laughs> That's your New Year's resolution? No no, no hugging? No more chefs. No oh, more no more chefs. chefs. Oh, I, I wasn't sure. I table knew what I was doing. Everybody else, don't worry about it. <laughs> All right. Well, on that odd, awkward moment, we're going to end. And you can explain it to everybody over drinks because I hope you all stay. I want to thank you all for coming because your energy makes everything Amazing go. Crowd. And so you guys really, are great. We had a packed today. It was so much fun. Details. Um, I want to thank Chris Neville, lead term to be the star, Woo! and Fire owner. We're all going to Berwyn. We are all going, going to Berwyn. 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 <laughs> First time that's ever happened. I, I want to thank Dessa for performing and being yeah. here.